As we discuss the power of prayer, there was one thing that always bothered me that your pastor could not understand. I read many works of prayer warriors, and people like George Mueller, for example, he was known as a man of prayer. He's probably one of the most famous men. And then you got E.M. Bounds as well. And then you have Praying Hyde. And then a lot of other people. Now, these people, when they would pray to the Lord, what is very powerful concerning this, which I could not understand, is that when they prayed, it's like they knew it would happen. Do you know what I mean? Most of the time when Christians pray, Christians, most of the time when we pray, it's during time, it's during uncertainty, right? Why? The reason why is because satanic forces are attacking us so much. And not only that, the trials of this world is really hitting us. And the flesh is really getting under our skin with temptation and sin as well. When you go through all these things, they sometimes hit you at once, right? You ever experience that? It's not like one enemy at a time. Sometimes it's like myriad things. When you're a Christian who's just saved, a newborn Christian, what is the experience when all of this hits you at once? It's obviously not, oh, I know what's going to happen next. It's what? Why is this happening? It's, Lord, I don't understand. It's, Lord, I need your help. Correct? When that happens, that's what happens with the newborn Christian life. If you are like these three people, they weren't confused. They weren't depressed. They weren't unsure. They knew. They had faith. And that's the key right there. You might say, what's the key? The key to this is that because we're newborn Christians, we are saved by faith. Amen? Amen? And faith does not require great faith. It's like the faith of a child, as Jesus mentioned. But we grow up in it, don't we? So as we spiritually grow, our faith becomes even stronger. That's where these people are at. Hopefully, as newborn Christians, our faith grows more that it can be established in faith just like these men. It's because they grew so much in faith. They went through so many of this and they prayed so many times through this that their faith got established even more and more and more. That's the key over there. So the thing is this, the reason why you're confused, you don't know about the future, is because you're still newborn as a Christian. You haven't seen how God answered the prayers yet. You didn't experience enough of those things where you know which prayers God answered, which prayers God did not answer. You've only seen some things, how the Holy Spirit moved, but not too much of it. Now, here's the thing, a lot of people think of me as a really spiritual preacher, but I'm going to be very honest, I am not. I am not a holy person. I am not a great person. If there's anything that you see in me of that, let me tell you a secret how. You know why? Because as soon as I surrendered myself to God, and I surrendered myself, as a matter of fact, to even torture and death, I gave up myself completely to God at the age of 14. I'll be honest is that I hope that I can keep up with that surrender. I mean, if it happened right now, I don't know what might happen. I'm flesh, right? I'm capable of weakness. But ever since I was 14, I surrendered that. When that happened, boom, this hit in, especially when I entered the ministry. Why did God immediately allow all these things to happen, we wonder, right? The reason why is this, so that I can start praying more. And I can... Through praying more, I ex this, is, this all totals up to experiencing it. When I experience that, it builds up what? My newborn faith into larger faith after that. Why? Because I've experienced enough of this 
then I know what's going to happen next. That's the thing. Sometimes we wonder, Pastor, this bad thing's happening in our church. Pastor, you know what they're saying bad things about you online. Pastor, uh, we just went through a church split. Pastor, your wife died. Pastor, your child passed away. Pastor, we got these bad things. You ever seen bad things going on and the members are the one who are weak and panicking, but the pastors, for some weird reason, they're the ones who are strong? You ever wondered why? The reason why is because they went through enough of this. Whereas the members in the church, they're new to the problem. You ever heard your pastor saying, stick around, you'll see this bad thing happening, that bad thing happening, this bad thing happening in the middle of the church, just stick around and, and then it just came to pass? You know why? Your pastor's been through that. Whereas the people who are fresh into church, they're newly experiencing that. So that's why the pastors, they feel more, they seem more strong, they seem more at peace. Why? Because they have more faith because they experienced and prayed through all of it, that they're at a point that whatever bad thing happens, I know God's going to take care of it. Why? Because he pulled me through so many times through prayer. I know that if that bad things happen, it's going to be all right. I've had enemies attacking me online, right? And you see how God took care of all of them? Yep. Yeah, he took care of all of them. Those people still have the audacity to still attack. And if they want to, man, you, they can die miserable. Some of them are even at, pro at a very ill state that they probably will end up dying that way, criticizing me. I know of some enemies that are really bad illnesses. I know of some people who started a movement of churches and they just lost automatically like almost 10 pastors like that. Yeah, those enemy pastors who are criticizing me and they start to plant their churches and their pastors, they lost 10 like within just less than three years or two years. See, God takes care of them. But let's look at how this pattern works. We turn to James 1, right? And then I want you to look at Romans 5. Look at this. Look how this pattern works. Look at Romans 5 and James 1. Now let's start off at Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Look at this pattern here. This is very interesting. Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, being justified by faith we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand so notice right here that we're saved by grace through faith right so because we have the salvation by faith salvation of grace we're now standing upon it right you see this pattern here newborn Christians say by faith we're standing on this Look how this foundation is built now. Check, check this out. Verse 3, and not only so, but we glory in what's next? Tribulations also. When you got saved and you started to attend this Bible-believing church, how many of you went through all kinds of weird, bad things that happened? I know a lot of you, I know most of you know what I'm talking about, even those online. Man, as soon as I entered this Bible-believing church, all of a sudden, this thing happens, that thing happens, I have to go through this problem, that problem. You know why? God's building you up. You know why? You're newly experiencing all this chaos at once. When you are lost in sin, before you knew Bible-believing truth, the devil didn't really bother much with you. Now, you might take that as something negative, but no, it's something where it establishes peace and confidence at the end where no matter what problem you go through in life, you can be at peace. That's the peace you want. You don't want the kind of peace where problems just get carried for you, eliminated for you. You know why? If you want that kind of peace, you will always live your life running away from problems. Living every day of your life fearful of what the next problem might occur. You don't want to live your life like that. You want to live a life that no matter what problems happen, you're still at peace. But that can only happen when you're going through this. All right, look at this. But we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh what? Patience. See, you're waiting on the Lord. And patience what? Experience. And experience what? Hope. And hope maketh not what? A shame because of the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. That's what happens. See, right now, a lot of you, or majority of you, especially you people online, it's tough. I know you're going through this right now. 
You know what stage you're in right now? You're at the stage of patience right now. During this time of patience, you know what you're supposed to do? You're supposed to be praying. And during this stage of patience, it's going to turn into a point where it's hope. Why? Because the love of God is spread abroad through all your hearts. Do you see these three words over here? Do you see how patience and prayer goes together? I'm going to show you two passages that show that. Okay? Before we go to James 1, go to James 5. James 5. Look at this pattern here. James 5. You want to live a life of prayer because that's where you really start to experience things with God. And that experience is so important that way your body and mind can remember it and then your body and mind can be at peace later on. What's interesting about ex existential psychotherapy is that they rely on the person's experience to establish their peace with them. So they try to concentrate on experiences. But see, they're trying to conjure up experiences out of thin air by the psychobabble stuff, by invisibility, by non-scientific stuff. It's unscientific, actually. There's a lot of research methods that are trying to establish things, which is difficult. The only thing they can, uh, the most you can get out of science for it is CBT, actually, cognitive behavioral therapy. But aside from that, Okay. Now, I know there's some science that can establish some of those theories, but it really lacks. A lot of it is just grabbed throughout a theory, invisibility, where people can feel good. See, it's all experiential experiences. But see, our experience is not empty. Our experience relies on the Word of God through the spiritual realm, through God Himself. That's why if ex existential psychotherapy see the importance of that, how much more with Christians with Jesus Christ? We have a greater advantage. But look at James 5, how patience goes along with prayer. Verse 11. The Bible says, Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of the Lord, and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. This patient comes from what? Verse 10. Suffering affliction, right? See, suffering this confusion of affliction, we go through patience. That's what we read. Romans 5, tribulation, patience. Correct? Correct. But let's keep reading over here what happens. What happens is in verse 16, confess your faults one to another and what? Pray one for another that ye may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. Look at this. Notice right here what goes along with the subject of patience and trials is also prayer. During this patience stage, my question to you online is, are you praying? I'll tell you what, if you haven't been praying, I do know this. If you're saved by faith and you have a tender heart for Jesus, when all this confusion happens, you are being forced to pray. That's what trial and affliction does. It forces you to pray. It forces you to ask brothers and sisters in Christ to pray for you. You get involved in prayer. That's why this is good for you. Because when you're finally forced into praying, what happens? Your faith establishes more and then you hit right here. And then you saw the verse where it says at Romans 5, it establishes hope and the love of God is spread about. And that's seen at 1 Corinthians 13. 1 Corinthians 13. Those are the three greatest gifts ever in life. The three greatest gifts ever that God has blessed you in your life. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Look at the final verse, 1 Corinthians 13, 13. Look what the Bible says. The Bible says, and now abideth faith, right? Hope, right? Charity, these three. See that? That's what the three are established. And what's going to happen is this. Once 
your faith becomes highly established through this method, you develop hope as well. Hope becomes more established. And then later on, as you continue to grow in life, you're going to realize the most important thing in life is the greatest of these is what? Charity. Amen. You're going to understand more and more the importance of loving God and loving one another. You're going to really understand that. You know one thing I, uh, you notice about these preachers, these Bible-believing preachers? Some of them will admit this. A lot of them were gung-ho and preached hard. Missionaries too. What made them soften up a lot more, where they were more loving to people and to God, you'll notice one thing. You know what it was? It was because of this, trial and affliction. That is a very interesting thing. You know why? It is through this that they went through this method and then they hit here more and more. That's intensely interesting. You want to be the person who hits that maturity at the end and who hits that kind of faith, believing that whatever God does, it will be truly for the best. Look at uh, 2 Peter chapter 1. We're looking at a lot of verses here. We're going to look at 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. And then we'll close it off with James 1, all right? I'm almost done. We're going to finish with these two verses. This is a lot of verses I'm giving to you because this shows the pattern of prayer here. How hope, faith, charity, patience, all of this and experience combined together into an important stage you want to hit in your life for peace. Look at verse 4. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Right? Because of our salvation. How is this pattern built up? Keep reading. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith, right? We were saved by faith. That's the context of the passage. Adding to the faith, look at this pattern, virtue. And to virtue, knowledge. And to knowledge, temperance. And to temperance, look what follows. What is it? Patience. See that? That's where patience comes after faith, right? We saw that. Look at that pattern. And to patience, godliness. And to godliness, look at this, brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, what? Charity. That's where you hit that final stage at the end. You see that? You see that? That's why these trials and afflictions are good for you, because it establishes all these important elements. Now let's go to James 1. Now let's go to James 1. Look at this, James chapter 1, verse 2. James chapter 1, verse 2. Look what James talked about with trials, prayer, faith, and patience. Verse 2, my brethren, count it all joy when he fall into divers temptations. Why? Knowing that the trying of your what? See that? You're saved by faith. When this faith is being built up, you're being going through temptation trial. As you go through this, it look at verse 3. Faith worketh what? Patience. Boom. Right there. See that? This is the stage you're going through right now. I wonder what you're doing right now. You want to take opportunity with prayer. You might say, why do I want that, Pastor? Because keep reading here, verse 4. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, let him what? Ask of God. See, prayer comes in within the stage here. That giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in what? Faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Look at this. Without faith, you're not going to claim it or to get it. What is important through the power of prayer, which always boggled me about these men, is that when they prayed, they weren't like thinking that it may be possible I may not get it. No, they know they're going to get it. They know that they're going to get it. 
they know they don't pray that when they don't pray like if I'm going to get it. No, they pray when I'm going to get it because it's a matter of patience. But then the problem becomes this. The problem becomes then, well, the Bible talks about when you pray, it's got to be according to God's will. So when we pray according to the will of God, a lot of times we don't know what God's real plan is, right? A lot of times when God hears your prayer, he doesn't say yes all the time, does he? Why? Because it's not according to his will. So he answers yes, no, and wait. But these people, when they pray, they knew it's going to be a yes. So then that boggled me. How do they do that? You know why? It's very simple. How you know the will of God is how much you grow in Him. When you grow more spiritually in God, you know more about God's working, His will. And that's established through a lot of reading His Word too, right? That's why reading His Word is important. A lot of it is by going to church, hearing other brothers and sisters in Christ, how God worked in them. The preacher explaining the Word of God to you, right? See that? So then, through all of this, that's why these basics are important. You guys don't think this is important. That is very important. You need to go to a Bible-believing church. You need to keep reading that Bible. That way you can know more about how God's, wills, God's will works. And the more you are established more on God's will, how it works, you know to Him what will please Him. And when you pray to Him, you know what exactly what to pray that will please him, and that is according to his will. That The reason why God answers no to your prayer request is because that verse says at the book of James again, that if you pray, don't pray where it's consumed upon your lust. A lot of it is for a fleshy reason. In fact, here's something very dangerous. What's very dangerous, if I were you, I'd be more of a person who'd be praying according to the will of God, rather than arrogantly claiming, I know you're going to answer this prayer, and then it doesn't turn out to be God's will. That's even more dangerous, didn't you know that? It's more safe to be unsure and say, Lord, I don't know the answer, but I surrender it according to your will. It's more safe to pray that than to arrogantly know and claim, I know this is your will, so this is going to happen, but it does not turn out to be God's will. You might say, why is that latter part more dangerous? Because here's one thing I learned about human nature, and I'm including myself here. In their fleshy mind, they confuse something spiritual with something fleshy. And the book of James says, be careful when you pray it. If it's consumed upon your loss, God's not going to answer that. That's the most dangerous thing. You know what the problem with Christians are? Arrogant Bible believers. They think that, oh, I know God's going to answer this. And then that's why they get very divisive and people in their lives. And they think they're so spiritual. But no, it's a fleshy reason why you're fussing about that doctrine. Why you're picking fights with other people. Why you think that you're, you can correct other preachers, etc., etc. Be careful with that arrogance, man. That can be confused with something fleshy called pride. Well, how do I know that I'm prideful and how do I know that I'm spiritual? It's very simple. You know what the simplicity is? See how much time you're spending on this, how much time you're spending on this, how much you're spending time getting closer to God, man. Look, if your testimony throughout other Bible believers is that they know you got social issues, personality issues, and a lot of Bible believers have that problem, man, you're not filled up with God. People know when you're filled up with God. Not you. See, people think, oh, unless I'm filled up with God, then I know I'm of God. No, a lot. it's not by you observing sometimes. It's other people observing. See, you're confusing it with uh, arrogance and pride. Arrogant pride people only look at themselves. Humble people don't. Humble people don't look at themselves and let other people see the accomplishment. Other people have to see your spiritual growth. And when other people see your spiritual growth, 
That's when you are a spiritual person. And when you're so much filled with that spiritual person, you know God's will, how it works in your life, and you know when you give that prayer request that you know God's going to answer that. But what helps a lot with faith as well is simply surrendering it to what? Yeah, that's it. Look, all you have to do when you focus your prayer on faith is just focus on the will of God and say, God, if you answer yes, no, or wait, I have complete faith and confidence. However way you're going to answer it, it is going to be the best. When you do that, what happens more and more, he reveals his will to you more and more. And then you see more and more of those things that you know more about God's will and you can pray confidently and you can know that when you give these prayer requests that God's going to answer it. But that's where these men are. They're already filled so much with prayer life that they know they're going to get answered. Me, I didn't hit too much at that level, but I am seeing some things. And I do know what God's going to answer. When I give specific prayers about... For example, some problems going on in the church, I know how God, when I pray it, how God's going to take care of the problem. I've hit sometimes in that point. When enemies attack me and I pray to the Lord, I know that God's going to take care of it. It's a scary thing. Your pastor did pray before, right, about the enemies, and then it just happened less than a season. God just went bam, bam, and bam. See? When your pastor's going through problems, when I pray to the Lord, I know when I'm going through my family problems, my personal problems, uh, my own problems, trials, financial, mental, etc. When I pray to the Lord, I know God's going to, how he's going to answer and take care of it. You know why? Because I've been too much of this. See that? Too much of this developed more of my faith and knowing his will. And that's where your pastor, he's... He stressed so many times, so, there's one thing I hope you learn from this pastor, especially at Sunday's preaching, a lot about prioritizing God and others. He worked on my charity and made me see that more and more. All right, that was a long lesson. All right, I'm, I'm finally done. I hope you, this is a valuable lesson you learn, and you'll take it home with you. It will it'll be very life-changing to you. Pray something where you know for a fact that God is going to answer. You want to hit that kind of prayer warrior life. But to hit that level is not through that fleshy arrogance. You better watch out for that. Well, how can I do it by faith then? Just like I told you before, just surrender it to God's will. Just have faith in His will. And then He's going to reveal His will more and more in time. Patience. A lot of people are impatient. It's in time.